hello and thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and this is our shelter at home edition of Mid-American Gardener that we've been doing since March. Um, of course, we've got our panelists on the line to answer any of your questions that you have, and let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So Kelly, we'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a uh, horticulture educator for U of I Extension. I am based out of Bloomington and my expertise lies in integrated pest management. What that really means is I really know how to kill bugs, even though I really love bugs. I just <laughs> kill them all. She kills them for us. You I do that for us. us. Right, Kelly? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I love talking about pollinators and beneficial insects and all those good bugs, but I also do a lot of vegetable gardening in my backyard and grow some native plants. So that's kind of my thing. Great. Okay. And uh, you've noticed we have a new face on the show tonight. So uh, Richard is here uh, joining us for the first time. So Richard, if you wouldn't mind, tell us your name and a little bit more about what interests you, where your education lies and kind of what your specialty is. Okay, sure. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Henschel, and I am also a, a horticulture educator with U of I Extension. And I'm located up outside of the Cook County area in a collar set of counties. I cover Kane, DuPage, and Kendall County. And um, my educational background is uh, ornamental horticulture. I grew up with a uh, family nursery. Um, so the growing, the transplanting, the propagation, the digging, and we won't talk about digging trees and shrubs by hand at this point, but uh, that's what, <laughs> that's what gave me the white beard, I think. Um, anyway, we're here. Um, love to, loving it that I get to, to share some of the knowledge here, um, on, uh, Mid American Gardener. Well, welcome, welcome, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you to answer. So, um, as always, we start with show and tells, and Kelly, I'm hearing that you have something uh, that you'd like to share. Yes, um, if you haven't already heard, but this is National Pollinator Week. So, you know, there's a lot of things you can do to celebrate National Pollinator Week. You know, plant some plants to, that you know that are going to help with pollinator health, um, you know, Refrain from spraying chemicals in your garden that can all contribute to good pollinator health. But there is a big celebration on Saturday. It's called a bee blitz. And it's put on by Bee Spotter, and that's through the University of Illinois. And what this is, is you upload pictures of bees that you find on flowers. And so what, what they'll do is they'll send you an email back and tell you what kind of bee it is. So no, you get, so you get to upload a picture and get to see what kind of bee it is. But what it does for the University of Illinois, is it gives them a lot of information about bee distribution around the state of Illinois. And it can really give them some insight on uh, bee health. One of the things that they're primarily interested in is bumblebees. So if you have a bumblebee, a honeybee, you know, some of those other bees and take a picture, submit it. it the Bee Blitz is July 27th. So that's Saturday. So that whole entire day, if you're out in your garden, go ahead and take an image of that bee and upload it to Bee Spotter. I forgot what month I was in. You're rushing the Saturday. summer, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rush the summer. <laughs> It's June 27th. This is National Pollinator Week. So gotcha. it's a great way to contribute to science at the University of Illinois. So let me ask you a question. Can you, um, are you supposed to photograph the bees only that day? Or um, can you photograph some and then send them that day? Do they want it to be actually? N no, you can do, you can photograph um, throughout at any time. And you can participate in Bee Spotter anytime. It, you know, Bee Blitz is kind of, it's, a, it's like a designated time, so mm -hmm. it is that time, but it's also a designated area, which is the state of Illinois. And whatever information you give is going to contribute to science, and they will be greatly appreciated. So um, okay. my only issue is all trying to get the bee in focus. Yes, yes, that, that's going to be the issue. They're all over. I've had a lot of... Um, 
common milkweed open up the last couple of days. And I mean, they are just caked on there. So I might be able to some, grab some good pictures. I, I think you should. Oh, I'm going to give it a shot. Okay. Thank you, okay. ma'am. And we'll try to show that graphic one more time before the show's okay. over so you guys can find it. Okay, Richard. So we're going to a plant ID question for you, number 941. And let's see, I'll pull it up here and read it. Um, let's see. Thank you for your show. I just moved to a home that has a lot of poison ivy growing in the ground covered borders. How do I get rid of the poison ivy? Thank you for your help, Rebecca Johnston. We get this one a lot. Now, are, is, is poison ivy really thick this year because we had that wet spring? It seems to be a lot more prevalent. And, you know, it kind of comes in three different versions. You've got the nice ground cover stuff, and then you've got the big old vine that eventually matures out and grows up the tree, which flowers and gives you the berries, which the birds eat and then deposit them elsewhere. And that's kind of where it gets started uh, on the ground after the after the birds have left the berries behind, that's the ground cover stage. And there's kind of can be an in-between stage where uh, if there's nothing for it to climb up, it just kind of clambers on top of itself and kind of becomes this messy, scruffy looking shrub. Uh, so right now they've recognized they've got the ground cover stage. And in terms of uh, controlling it or managing it, that's going to take some effort and some time based on what else is growing in that bed. If everything else that's where the poison ivy is, is relatively weedy and they're not concerned, an overall treatment of a non-selective uh, herbicide product will take care of that, but it also takes care of everything else that's in there. If, on the other hand, uh, what's in there are grass, is, is in grassy kinds of plants, then a selective poison ivy poison oak kind of a product that you can also buy at, at, at your local garden center will function. And so it'll help manage the broad leaf problem, the poison ivy, and then leave the grasses alone. Um, if there is a height differential between the poison ivy and the ground cover plants, meaning we hope that the poison ivy is up here and the other ground cover plants are here, you can use uh, something the equivalent of what we call a rope wick applicator. Uh, homeowners might use uh, the trim roller and the trim tray, and you literally are painting the products on the poison ivy like a non-selective material. The poison ivy will be controlled, but the more valuable ground covers below it will, will be saved. They won't be uh, treated, so they'll survive that treatment, which would otherwise take them out as as well. Um, part of figuring this out is, you know, we know that we're looking down and there's a poison ivy on the ground. We need to look up and see if even the source of that material is coming from a mature vine in their, in their trees. And then we should also take care of that at an appropriate time. Usually in the winter time, we cut the, we cut the big stem of the poison ivy with the hairy roots that are grasping the tree trunk and uh, kill that over the winter time and then maybe do a stump treatment as well come spring to keep it from resprouting. Wow, that sounds like a big job. <laughs> it's a lot of work. If you have it established, it is a lot of work over and it's going to be maybe two or three seasons before you really get it under control because it's really? a woody plant and there's an extensive root system that goes along with it. So wow, there's lots I of food no reserves. Idea. Yeah, it's a, a I had job. no idea that there there was someone last summer that wrote in with a similar issue. Um their their yard took kind of a dip and it was just completely full of poison ivy. So I wonder how they're faring this year. Um, because I didn't know it was a multiple season type problem. So yeah, it's a woody ornamental and it takes not ornamental, it's a woody plant, so it takes quite an effort to completely get rid of it. And it's and it's you can't pull it because you get poison ivy. You can't uh, collect it and burn it to get rid of it because in the smoke are the oils that give you the poison ivy and you don't want that on your face. You don't want to inhale that. That's a, uh, I've, I've witnessed uh, uh, a patient coming back out of the hospital after a 10 day stay, having worked in their yard and not realizing carrying it in their arms, uh, mm -hmm that it was all poison ivy. They thought it was the vines on the side of the house and things that they were taking down and they spent 10 days. So it's, it's nasty stuff. You know, just don't want to get it. 
Okay. Thank you very much. All mm-hmm. right, Kelly, we're going back to you, Plant ID. Uh, this was sent in by Darlene. And she says, I found this at the base of my tree when cleaning up debris around it. Do you know what these are? So let's take a look and see if you can help Darlene out. What do you think? Um, so they're not plants. It's actually a fungus. And it's called Dead Man's Fingers, or what Tanisha called it was... Dead Man's Toes. Dead Man's Toes. Good job. Thank you. I get my sticker for the day. It's a fungus that lives on dead or decaying wood. Um, And that tells you right there that the tree where you found it near is probably stressed out. Um, We have a lot of stressed trees right now. because we had that cool wet spring and we have some fungal issues and then um, we've had some droughts in the past. Um, So uh, it doesn't mean that the tree is necessarily going to die. It just means that tree is best. Um, I wouldn't worry about the particular fungus or removing it in any way, but I would worry about taking better care of that potential tree. Meaning if it, if we go through another drought, water it one to two inches a week. I usually say two inches a week, the temperatures are above 90 degrees. Um, another thing is, and Richard can attest to this, we usually don't have to fertilize trees here in Illinois because we have pretty great soil, but this might be an opportun- a time for you to give the, that, um, those trees a little extra energy in the form of fertilizer, help it make its food a little bit better. Um, and then, you know, maybe think about, um, you know, mulch. Uh, a nice mulch ring around a, a tree will um, conserve the moisture better. Um, so that would be just... I, I think it's really cool. When I saw the picture, I was super excited to identify it. But it just tells you that you have a stress tree. The trees go, trees have stress and they have fungus on them all the time. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's dying. But I do think you need to think about how you're caring for that tree. Okay. Richard, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, just from the picture, it that seems to have a lot of woody organic matter around it. Maybe, what do you think? Uh, Maybe it is not coming from the tree. It could just be growing on the dead decaying organic matter that already existed there. And we, and as Kelly said, we've just had all this rain and all the cool wet weather. We just really are providing the exact environment for these kinds of mushrooms or, or molds and things like that. So that's quite, quite logical that it's there in terms of fertilization we're really not so much giving the plant extra as much as we're just helping it get what it could have been making had we had it not stressed, had it been a healthy tree to begin with. So we shouldn't expect remarkably amazing things to happen because we fertilize. It's just getting it back to a good state of health as Kelly talked about. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And he's totally right. Um, I didn't think about that, but you know, some funguses grow on the mulch that we put around the base of our trees, like dog vomit fungus. Have you heard of that one, Tanisha? I haven't, but I'm going to make a note. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You'll know what it looks like when you yes. see it. Yes, <laughs> yes. It is awesome. It's another one of them where you're really excited to see it. <laughs> but, yes. I'll be yes. looking at a dog vomit. Dog mold. vomit fungus. Fungus. Okay. And that's exactly what we call it. Okay. Good deal. And that's All what right. clients call it when they call in. They know it, huh? They, they know, know when they've got well, it. Well, they know what it looks like, so they are calling to find yeah. out what it is. Well, or, I mean, another dog vomit slime mold is really the official. Got it. It's not the orange one, is it? It, it? it can be orange and yellow. Okay, maybe I've seen it. I may be thinking of it. Growing, I'm, I, I would say, you know, you being a gardener, you probably have seen it. I think I have. I think I'll, I'll be... I'll be surprised when I see it. Okay, on to the next one, 951. Uh, This one is from Deborah. Last year, my tree was looking a little sad and the leaves had some black spots. Uh, She sent some pictures in as well. This year, many of the branches have no leaves and the flowers were sparse. 
Uh, I love this tree, she says. We had it trimmed in the fall, fed it in the spring. So they're taking really, really good care of this tree, um, but it's still just struggling to survive. So uh, let's take a look at the pictures that she sent in and see if you guys can give her any feedback. She sent in several pics here. So they take great care of it and it's just looking kind of sad. Well, I'll I'll step up right off the bat here. What we're looking at there is the, this is all fungal. Uh, again, with the cool, wet weather, uh, can't quite tell from these images which one. It kind of resembles cedar apple rust, which has the yellowy halo around the darkened area. Um, uh, the, the foliage won't fall off with cedar apple rust, although heavily infested leaves probably will. Um, we looking at uh, the different pictures here, they appear to be a bit of a lighter green indicating uh, there's a food or a lack of food somewhat deficient. There's uh, in these pictures, there's an awful lot of dead wood and it can't just possibly be from only this year. Uh, so one of the criteria would be dead wood is dead. It's non-productive. You can prune it away. You can prune it out of the tree at any time. You don't know what good wood you have until you get rid of all the bad old dead wood. So uh, this could, could be a, a weekend warrior kind of a thing where you really go through and take out the dead wood and then you kind of step back and get to see what's left. Uh, this is a, clearly a mature, older crab apple here in the pictures. Um, and then that picture itself even shows that's an absolutely completely dead branch at this point. If there was life just around the inside of the bark, you would see some green, wet looking tissue. That's a live cambium tissue, but this is all dead. Um, we had some issues, you know, we had the, the polar vortex, the winter of 1819, and then we thought all our trees recovered during the, the growing season of 2019. And while they might have looked okay, they hadn't recovered. And then the damage just furthered itself this past winter, even though it was mild. They mm -hmm. just weren't in a strong enough state of health to survive even a mild winter. So we saw and have seen a lot of um, branches and flowering shrubs and trees that were alive last year that are just absolutely, as the client's talking about here, absolutely dead this spring. Question for you, Richard. You mentioned the color of the leaves. You said they were lighter, which kind of signaled a deficiency. I've never heard that before. Is that across the board with trees or is that just that yeah, something most unique to crab? No, no. Most plants, if it's a light green, there's a lack of chlorophyll happening in the plant. The chlorophyll is, is, is the part of the leaf tissue that makes the, the dark green stuff. Uh, and that's the color we see. And when they're lighter green, that says there's probably a, a vascular issue that the leaves are not getting the right food from the root system or a, a lack of moisture. And that all goes back to how far damaged maybe in the 1819 polar vortex the Cambian became. Uh, it's That's not uncommon. Uh, an easy feed, if you will, um, the the um, mineral or element iron can, is can be sprayed on the foliage as a liquid and it can be foliarly absorbed. So you can take that yellow green leaf and turn it deep green in a day or two. And if that happens, then you are pretty sure that it's a problem with the vascular tissue moving food and water up and down. Oh, fascinating. I, I learned something new today. Okay, we're going to Kelly, 938. Uh, this is about uh, amaryllis. We have this beautiful amaryllis in bloom right now. These poor bulbs were used and abused and not watered forever. Put the poor thing in the patio a few weeks ago and then boom, started to bloom. Question is, uh, one of the pictures, you will see a new little bud appearing on the main stem of the bloom. Is that a common occurrence? Um, she said they were very surprised to see it. Also, there are three or four bulbs in a small pot. Should I replant each one in a different pot? Um, after it's finished blooming. So let's see what she's got. Now, the first part of the question is, okay, um, the new little bloom, is that a common occurrence? Well, you know, it's the size of the bulbs. If you've ever gone to buy an amaryllis bulb in fall um, to get ready for the holidays, you'll have smaller bulbs that'll be a little bit cheaper. Then you'll have larger bulbs that'll be a little bit more expensive. And the larger bulbs will actually produce multiple flowering stalks, it, not just one per bulb. It can produce two or three. And that's why you would purchase that larger bulb. 
Um, it's kind of funny that she says that it's been used and abused because that's what we do to it in the industry on purpose. Okay, when you think about how we produce amaryllises, first of all, we do want them to be in a shallow container and we don't want them to have a lot of room. So those three bulbs in that container be just fine. Um, the, the second thing is how, how do I, as a grower, I used to be a greenhouse grower in greenhouse. <laughs> 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 and one of the things that I grew was amaryllises. So what you do is um, you, um, you can start from new with a new bulb in the fall. But another thing that I used to do is I used to overwinter them in a way and um, grow up and just harvest the flowers. So what you do is you treat that plant after it blooms, you cut the flowering stalk off. Then you treat that plant like a house plant for the rest of the season. Starting in August, August through October, you allow that plant to go dormant, meaning you don't water it, you don't give it sun, you put it on its side in the garage. You pull it out October. It takes about four to eight weeks for it to bloom once you start resuming the watering again. So you pull that pot out, you start watering it again, and in four to eight weeks, you're going to have another flower. After it flowers, it's going to produce leaves. You continue to treat that plant like a house plant with those leaves, watering it, fertilizing it, giving it a little bit of sun. Then again, in August, make it go dormant. So you're, that's how people have continuous uh, amaryllis in its bloom. But a lot of people do start from new. So did I answer the question? I think you did. You covered okay. everything. You covered everything. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We've got about five minutes left. We're going to go to Richard. Uh, we've got another ID question. So she was watching an earlier show where we talked about the cool, wet spring. Um, so she purchased a pink dogwood. It was planted at the end of May, uh, seven feet. The, the leaves are curling from the tips. Um, she says this is occurring throughout the entire tree. They haven't fallen. Um, but the tree is kind of struggling a bit. She says when she touches them, they almost fall off. Um, some of them do. So just wanting to know how to get this newly planted tree healthy and ready to take off. And the big question is at the end, do you think it will survive? So how do you fix it? And is it going to live? <laughs> okay. So I'm sure as a new transplant this spring, we're seeing it going through transplant shock. The fact that the very tips of the leaves are browning says that very tip is the most sensitive tissue <clears throat> on the leaf uh, of the leaves. So if there's a lack of anything happening, it impacts the tips of the leaves or the very edges of the leaves. So the, and also the the way she's described how they're growing or the fact that there are some of them falling off. I'm sure this is a transplant shock situation, and it's going to be up to the tree itself to. Rec recover. Um, Kelly talked about watering our plants. This has a limited root system. And while the soil around the root ball may have moisture in it, the ball itself may be drier. So she should check for soil moisture right at the base of the tree trunk itself, not out any distance because it, that limited root system, that's the only place it could get water from. It may be too dry where the surrounding soil may have adequate moisture. So I check for soil moisture. Um, that'd be a big part of it. Uh, it's not recommended that you really feed a brand new tree because you're going to force it to grow and still have a limited root system, which will stress it. So water is the best thing to do right now. Um, if the leaves are falling off, it's because the tree can't maintain those leaves. And that's just a natural situation that's going to occur. Uh, if some of the older inner leaves fall off and you had to generate some more new knee leaves at the brand new ends of the tips, fine. That says the tree's okay with that. It can support those new leaves. Uh, whether it survives the first winter or not is really going to be plant dependent. There's no way of, of really knowing. You can make sure you do some things. You can water it late in the season. You can mulch with straw six, eight inches deep 
after we get lots of cold weather and that just moderates the soil temperature and allows the roots to grow even though the so the air temperatures might be below freezing. So you get to uh, allow the roots to continue to grow and develop in the fall and then hope for a mild winter. And, and it is a dogwood and it is a dogwood, which sometimes depends upon, I can't grow dogwoods up here. I'm too far north and they usually, they may live and rarely flower because of the cold weather that kills the flower buds, the vegetative buds stay alive. So uh, farther down, the farther we go in the state, the safer you are. But it's still a, it's still a dogwood in, uh, I'm guessing here, central Illinois. So okay. that's things you should watch out for. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, we've got about a minute left. So, Kelly, I want to go back to you to make sure uh, folks know again about the Bee Blitz. That's mm -hmm. coming up this weekend, right? This Saturday, yep. Okay. okay. June 27th. <laughs> this Saturday, go out into your garden take a picture of a bee, then come in inside, go on to Bee Spotter. It asks you a few questions to get you set up. Something fun for everybody to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Get the kids out there and start looking for bees. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your time and talents. Richard, welcome aboard. I hope we uh, get to chat with you again. We have a lot of viewers up in your neck of the woods, so it'll be nice to be able to talk about the just that slight differential in zones and the uh, the expertise you can provide. So thank you very much. And you're quite, you're quite we welcome. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.